Boy, God sure has been good to us, uh, in, even in this season. I would say, especially in this season. And uh, we're grateful uh, that uh, we know that everything that we're going through is in the Lord's control, in the Lord's hands. And uh, we trust in that. We're thankful for His power that's available to us today. And that's a great segue into what we're going to be talking about today. So turn in your Bibles to the book of Mark, chapter 5. I'll give this to someone here. I'll put this down here. All right, Mark chapter 5, and uh, we'll begin in verse number 21. And then I'm going to go ahead and warn you to go ahead and go to the book of Leviticus. Now, we're going to be here in the book of Mark, but I'm just going to give you a head start because we're going to look at some great verses in the book of Leviticus. You say, is there such a thing as great verses in the Leviticus? You better believe it, especially when we're talking about here in Mark chapter 5. So I'm so thankful uh, that you are here. Verse number 21, the Bible says, And when Jesus was passed over again by ship unto the other side, much people gathered unto him, and he was nigh unto the sea. And behold, there cometh one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name. And when he saw him, he fell at his feet, and besought him greatly, saying, my little daughter lieth at the point of death. I pray thee, come and lay thy hands on her that she may be healed and she shall live. And Jesus went with him and much people followed him and thronged him. And a certain woman which had an issue of blood 12 years and had suffered many things of the physicians and had spent all that she had and was nothing bettered, but rather grew worse. And she had heard of Jesus and she came to the press behind and touched his garment. For she said, if I may touch but his clothes, I shall be whole. And straightway the fountain of her blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of that plague. And Jesus, immediately knowing in himself that virtue had gone out of him, turned him about in the press and said, who touched my clothes? And his disciples said unto him, uh, Jesus, thou seest the multitude thronging thee and sayest thou who touched me? And he looked round about to see her that had done this thing. But the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what was done in her, came and fell down before him and told him all the truth. And he said unto her, Daughter, thy faith hath made thee whole. Go in peace and be whole of thy plague. What an encouraging message today. Looking forward to preaching it. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your word. We're also thankful for your power today. And Father, I just pray that today you would help us, uh, Lord, be thankful, be grateful for that power, the power of God that's available to us today. We're grateful in Jesus' name. Amen. And you may have heard the story about the 83-year-old man that had lived his entire life as a bachelor. Can you imagine? One day, he gathered his four nephews and announced that 83 years old, he was planning to get married. Well, his nephews were in shock. One said, Uncle, are you getting married because this woman is beautiful? He said, no, nah, no. Nah. Another nephew said, Uncle, are you getting married because this woman is a great cook? He said, no, no, I'm not, no. The third nephew said, are you marrying this woman because she is rich? Of course not, the old man said. The final nephew said, Uncle, if you're not marrying this woman because she's beautiful or because she's a great cook or because she's rich, then why in the world are you marrying her? Well, he said this. He said, I'm marrying her because she can drive at night. Amen. <laughs> I like a man that knows what he needs. Amen. Well, here in the uh, book of Mark chapter 5, once again, if you remember when Jesus left the coast, you know, left the, the city uh, where the, he had healed the demonic man, they couldn't wait for him to get out of town. They wanted him to leave their coast. And so just as he had left and they had breathed a sigh of relief. There was another crowd that was waiting that couldn't wait for him to get there. Hmm, isn't that something? In that latter crowd, we are introduced to two different people that we'll be covering over the next two weeks. Jairus, who had a daughter who was sick unto death, and this unnamed woman, an anonymous woman that was suffering from what we could call an incurable disease. It was Jairus who approached Jesus first, but it was the woman who was first helped. And so in our text today, we're going to begin with her. 
The contrast that I find here in the text is striking about these two individuals that to me shows the wideness of the Lord Jesus' mercy and love. You find Jairus on the one hand who was an important synagogue officer and the woman was anonymous, nobody. She didn't even have a name here in the text and Jesus welcomed and helped both of them. Would you notice too that Jesus or that Jairus was about to lose a daughter who had given him 12 years of happiness? According to verse number 42, she was 12. And here was the woman that was about to lose an affliction that had brought her 12 years of sorrow. Striking. Being a synagogue officer, Jairus was no doubt wealthy, but his wealth could not save his dying daughter. Here we find the anonymous woman was already bankrupt. She had spent all she had to try to find a cure for this disease. Both Jairus and the poor woman found the answers at the same place. Notice in verse number 22 of Mark chapter 5, and when Jairus saw the Lord Jesus, notice he fell at his feet. And then on down in verse number 33, we find for the woman, knowing what was done in her, came and fell down before him. Both Jairus and the anonymous woman found the answers at the same place at the feet of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now Jesus said in Matthew chapter 28 and verse number 18, he said, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse number 18, for the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. The Bible goes on to say in 2 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse number 4, For though he was crucified through weakness, yet he liveth by the power of God. For we also are weak in him, but shall live with him by the power of God toward you. We're talking about the availability of the power of God that we see displayed here in Mark chapter 5. The power of the Lord Jesus Christ that was able to eradicate this woman's blood issue is the same power that is available to us today through salvation. And from this example, we're going to see why we should be eternally grateful that the power of God is available to us today. So number one, I want you to see why should we be grateful for Christ's power? Why should we be grateful for Christ's power, number one? Because it is particular. Do you realize that Jesus had something that nobody else had? It's only for him. Notice here in the text, one of the rulers of the synagogue comes to him, and his name is Jairus. You can see that falling at Christ's feet, notice that's an act of worship. And Jesus didn't stop him here in the text. Look at verse 22. And behold, there cometh one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name. And when he saw him, he fell at his feet. And he besought him greatly. Now, if Jesus never claimed to be God, like many today believe and teach, what do you make of that? Where Jairus comes and falls at his feet in worship, and Jesus doesn't stop him. He didn't tell him to get up because he wasn't God. Here is Jesus accepting worship as God. If he weren't who he said he was, God Almighty in the flesh, then he was guilty of exactly what the Jews were accusing him of, blasphemy. Jairus' little girl is about to die and he wants Jesus to come and heal her, plain and simple. Now back in verse number 21, we read of the crowd that came out to see Jesus. The Bible says that the throng of people followed him as he made his way to Jairus' house. And as a matter of fact, uh, Luke tells us that the crowd was so thick that they're pressing up against the Lord. The Bible uses the term thronging him. And in that crowd of people, can you imagine as they're walking? This would, that would be the opposite of what we're trying to deal with today with social distancing. Amen. In that crowd, here is one particular woman hoping to receive something from the Lord while lost in the crowd of people. This nameless woman, the Bible says, has an issue of blood. Verse number 25, 12 years. That's the same age as Jairus' daughter, according to verse 42. The number 12 in the word of God 
must help us to pause for a moment, help us to realize that that's the number of Israel as a nation. And so undoubtedly what you have here is a picture of Israel and their unbelief needing their king. Not only that, of course, we see these signs that Jesus is about to display once again to the Jew that he is indeed who he says he is. Now the Bible defines what an issue is, amen? Some of y'all think you've got issues today. Well, hopefully you don't have issues like the Bible says an issue is. Let's, I hope that you've gone to Leviticus. Hold your place here in Mark and let's go to Leviticus chapter 15. Let's define what an issue is in the scripture. Look at verse number two. <laughs> an issue in the word of God is something that's coming out of your body that's not supposed to come out. How about that? Verse number two, two, speaking to the children of Israel and saying to them, when any man hath a running issue out of his flesh, because of his issue, he is unclean. And this shall be his uncleanness in his issue, whether his flesh run with the issue or his flesh be stopped from his issue, it is his uncleanness. How about that? Yuck. Now let's go to verse number 19. And if a woman have an issue, now we just met one over here in Mark chapter five. If a woman have an issue and her issue in her flesh be blood, she shall be put apart seven days. And whosoever toucheth her shall be unclean until the even. And everything that she, that, that she lieth upon in her separation shall be unclean. Everything also that she sitteth upon shall be unclean. And whosoever toucheth her bed shall wash his clothes and bathe himself in water. Well, this is... We got the answer to the coronavirus right here in the text, right? Everything also that she sit upon shall be unclean. He shall wash his clothes, bathe himself in water, and be unclean until the even. And whosoever toucheth anything, verse 22, that she uh, sat upon shall wash his clothes and bathe himself in water and be unclean even until the even. And if it be on her bed or on anything whereon she sitteth, when he toucheth it, he shall be unclean even to the even. Do, do you see where we're going here? And if any man lie with her at all and her flowers be upon him, then he shall be unclean seven days and all the bed whereon he lies shall be unclean. And if a woman have an issue of her blood many days out of the time of her separation, or if it run beyond the time of her separation, all the days of the issue of her uncleanness shall be as the days of her separation. 12 years in the case of Mark chapter five. She shall be unclean. So notice now what she has gone through. Notice how she has suffered. This woman has been cast off from her people, according to the scripture, according to the law, until the issue of her blood is dried up. Well, it's been 12 years. 12 years she's been isolated with her condition. Notice the only remedy. Look on down in Leviticus 15, look at verse number 30. The only thing that can make her clean again would be a blood sacrifice. Look at verse 30. And the priest shall offer the one for a sin offering and the other for a burnt offering. And the priest shall make an atonement for her before the Lord for the issue of her uncleanness. Thus shall ye separate the children of Israel from their uncleanness, that they die not in their uncleanness when they defile my tabernacle that is among them. So putting all that together, we see a great picture of what's being described here in Leviticus 15 with the woman that had the issue of blood coming to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now notice how bad it was. Look at verse 26. And had... Look at the word, suffered. The woman was forced to endure a lot of different experimental treatments on her from a lot of different doctors over the past 12 years of her life, and every one of them was met with no success. Instead of getting better, her, the Bible says her condition only got worse. Although she tried every other remedy she could, her blood problem, listen to me today, could not be fixed by anyone. The Bible says she spent all that she had, all of her money to find a cure, but to no avail. The only person she had not yet tried was the person she comes in contact with here in Mark chapter five, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, as Jesus is thronged by the mass of people, the Bible says that the woman comes up behind him and touches his garment. It says here, verse number 27, uh, and touched his garment. I like what Luke says to help us understand exactly where 
on his garment she touched, because this is important. Luke chapter 8 and verse number 44. It says, and came behind him and touched the border of his garment. The border of his garment. That is significant. And the Bible says immediately when she did that, she touched the border of his garment, the blood issue dried up. She could immediately feel it in her body, whatever that was. So the problem, listen, of 12 years, which could not be helped by doctors, is immediately fixed when the woman merely touches the hem of the Lord Jesus Christ's garment. Well, that is interesting to note. Why the hem of the garment? Hold your place. Go to Exodus chapter 28. I love this. I love how this all goes together. It's so fun. Exodus chapter 28. Look at verse number 31. Exodus 28 and verse number 31. Talking about the high priest garments. And thou shalt make the robe of the ephod all of blue, and there shall be a hole in the top of it and in the midst thereof. And it shall have a binding of woven work round about the hole of it, as it were the hole of a habergeon, that it be not rent. And beneath upon the hem of it, thou shalt make pomegranates of blue and of purple and of scarlet round about the hem thereof and bells of gold between them round about. This is so good. Bells. A golden bell and a pomegranate. A golden bell and a pomegranate about the hem of the robe round about. So there's a bell, pomegranate, bell, pomegranate, you know, every other time. Notice, and it shall be upon Aaron to minister. And his sound shall be heard when he goeth in unto the holy place before the Lord. And when he, op- and when he cometh out, that he die not. So there is something put at the hem, the border of the garment of the high priest, right? And and at the hem of that garment were bells and pomegranates. So he can walk around with the bells ringing so that the people that were outside of the holiest place in the tabernacle and temple would know that the high priest wasn't dead. Isn't that good? Know that he was alive and that he was ministering and that he was working in the presence of God. Amazing. Notice that when Jesus had the border of his garment touched by this woman, she was immediately healed. We should be grateful for the Lord's power today because there's only one that can give us the remedy of our sin problem, of our blood issue. Do you realize today that every one of us that was born of Adam has a blood issue today? Every one of us is born in sin. I like what Romans chapter 5 says. Romans 5 in verse number 12. It says this, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, so that death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Who is that? That's everybody. Romans chapter 3 and verse number 8 tells us, And not rather, as we be slanderously reported, and as some affirm that we say, let us do evil that good may come, whose damnation is just. What then? Are we better than they? No, in no wise. For we have before proved both uh, Jews and Gentiles that they are all under sin. Everybody. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. Isaiah 59 tells us that our iniquities have separated us between us and God. And without the shedding of blood, Hebrews 9.22 tells us, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. Jesus Christ shed his blood by a Roman scourge and a cruel cross so that our blood problem can be eternally eradicated. The Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse number 24, who uh, his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sin should live unto righteousness by whose stripes ye are healed. There was only one person that was not only crucified that day, but has ever been crucified whose blood was good enough to take care of our blood problem. The Lord Jesus Christ. We should be thankful for the power of God available to us today because he is the only one that can save us. I like what Acts chapter 4 and verse number 12 says, neither is there salvation uh, in any other, for there is none other name under heaven whereby men must be saved. Just like the priest's robe, we are saved by Jesus Christ, and we can know that we're saved. Just like the the border of the garment helped everybody know that the high priest was the one that was representing Israel and that he was right with God. 
Only Jesus Christ, only by his power can you and I have eternal life. Isn't that wonderful? Why should we be grateful for Christ's power? Because it is particular. It's only him. He's the only one. He is the only way to heaven. And I want you to see, secondly, it is personal. His power is available to us, not as a corporate body, but as an individual. He loves you as a person. He loves you and cares about your life individually. I love that in the throng of the people and in the business of trying to get to Jairus' daughter and she touches the border of his garment, the Bible says that Jesus stopped what he's doing, that he felt virtue go out of him. That is amazing. The Bible defines virtue. Listen, Proverbs 31, verse number 10, who can find a virtuous woman for her price is far above rubies. The heart of her husband doth safely trust in her so that he have no need of spoil. She will do him good and not evil all the days of her life, of his life. Notice, virtue seems to be good done to someone that never falters or wavers. That's what virtue is. Jesus had virtue gone out of him. And notice, healed the woman permanently. I can't wait to talk about that in a moment. And notice what it says here. Jesus stopped. And he, say, and, and he says this, who touched my clothes? Who touched me? Wow. Notice he wanted to know who it was. The woman fearing, trembling, knowing what was done in her, came and fell down before him and told him all the truth. He looked round about. Look at verse number 32. He looked round about. Not to see the crowd, but to see her. Amazing. Do you realize we should be grateful to Christ because he is interested, concerned, and committed to your life as an individual. It amazes me to contemplate that Jesus Christ, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, who is not subject to time like we are, that has knew, known every single person who has ever existed since Adam was created there in the garden, can not only pick us out of a crowd and see us personally, but that cares to know us individually. Wow. Wow. Not only does Jesus give us eternal life, but he seeks to bless us and have a relationship with us and gives us the ability to live righteously and holy while we are still here in this wicked, cursed earth. We are being thronged by the world. We, we can get lost in the masses of people and there may be nobody in our life that cares about us like, like, like we would want for them to. But notice here today that Jesus Christ stopped what he was doing because he cared about the woman so much and wanted to know her individually. Wow. You know what it amazes me is that at the, at the border of the garment of the high priest was not only bells to know that he was living, to know that he was the high priest representing the people, and knows he was walking about in the presence of God, but notice also the pomegranates. What a great picture that is once again. A golden bell and a pomegranate, Exodus 28 says. See, it reminds me that not only at the border of the garment of the high priest was there, notice, uh, knowledge of life, of living with the bells, but notice there was also blessing and reward. The pomegranate, that picture of fruit. You know what happens when we associate, when we decide to abide in Christ? The Bible says he is the vine and we are the branches. You know what our job is? To produce fruit. That's only available by our relationship with the Lord. Isn't that amazing? Philippians 1, uh, 11 says, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ, unto the glory and praise of God. Christ gives you the ability to bring glory to God in your life through fruits of righteousness. Romans chapter 6 and verse number 20 says, for when ye were the servants of sin, ye were free from righteousness. What fruit? Had ye then, and those things whereof ye are now ashamed, for the end of those things is death. But now, being made free from sin and become the servants to God, ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. Blessing, reward, purpose, worthiness 
are at the border of the garment of the Lord Jesus Christ. And of course, Galatians 5 tells us the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. There's blessing and reward, individual relationship. You notice that separates us from everybody. You think about other religions, how they worship their false gods today. To worship Allah, for example, you've got to strap a bomb to your chest and blow up infidels. It's not fruit. To worship Molech, you had to burn your children in the fire. To worship Buddha, you have to withhold from yourself many normal necessities of life. To worship Baal, you had to cut yourself upon the altar. Listen to me today. But to worship the Lord Jesus Christ, you will be treated like his beloved child whose father cares about their well-being and seeks him out to reward him. Wow. What a stark contrast to how to worship any other false god. You're not just another number with the Lord. He cares about your life. You are his precious child. Speaking of precious children, I've had to spend more time with my kids over the past six weeks than I ever have in their life. It's starting to wear on me. And the other day we were in the car. We like to just go for drives now, you know, just try to do something. And I noticed that as I drive, it doesn't really calm me down. It gets me more riled up, you know. And I really struggle with road rage sometimes because of the utter incompetency of people that have a license that are allowed to be behind a wheel that shouldn't be. And the other day I was getting frustrated. I was following a car that was just not even going to, I couldn't get around them, you know, and they come up to a stoplight and then you can, you can see their head go down. What are they doing? Well, they're looking at their phone. So the, the light turns green and they haven't gone. It happened to be a Dodge. And of course, Abraham is very aware of what's going on, you know, in the car. And, and so I was really trying, you know, to not yell. And so I, ah, come on, dodge, like that. And Abraham says, they not dogs, daddy. They people. Amen. <laughs> Thanks, Abraham. I'm not taking you anywhere anymore. Amen. Why should we be grateful for Christ's power? You ought to hear the six people that are in the room today. Just give me the, the groan right there. The groan, the gospel groan. Why should we be grateful for Christ's power? Is because it's particular, only the Lord. I want you to see it's personal. Who touched me? I want to know her. And then I love number three here. The reason why we should be grateful for the power of, of Christ is because it's pitying. He has mercy on us. He loves us. He cares. It's pitying. Full of pity. Notice when... Jesus stopped to find out who touched him. The woman immediately feared. Look at verse 33. But the woman fearing and trembling, knowing what was done in her, came and fell down before him and told him all the truth. One more aspect of that back over in Luke chapter 8. The Bible says this. I love this. Look at verse 47. And when the woman saw that she was not hid... Because the Lord cared about her individually. She came trembling and falling down before him. She declared unto him before all the people for what cause she had touched him and how she was immediately healed. Wow. So notice the progression. She fears. She worships. And then she tells everybody what Jesus did. That's being the Lord's disciple, isn't it? That's doing what Christ has called us to do in this world. Worship, and a natural result of fear is worship. And a natural result of worship is witnessing. They all go together. They all tie in. And I want you to notice how tenderly, you know what amazes me? I read the text here. The, the tenderness in Jesus' words for her are greater than, than just about any other place in the Gospels, including when he's talking to his own family. Notice what he says in verse number 34. And he said unto her, I just, I love that. I can just imagine him saying this to her as she's trembling, worshiping. He says, daughter, thy faith hath made thee whole. Go in peace and be whole of thy plague. What a great picture that is once again of salvation. Just like, remember when, when the demonic, when he, Legion was cast out and they went to the swine, there was never a chance of him being possessed by Legion again. Notice here again, once she was healed, 
No chance it was coming back. No chance. What a great picture that is of our eternal security. Amen. Notice how tenderly he calls her his daughter. He gives her comfort. He tells her that she has been healed and to go in peace. He gives her peace in her life. And then he promises her that she's whole. Don't, don't worry, daughter. Tomorrow when you get up, it's still going to be gone. Ten years from now, don't worry, it's never coming back. You are whole of your plague. Twelve years she's had to struggle with this. Now notice, you know what I found striking once again? Is it because of her witness? Go over to, to Matthew chapter 14. Love when the scripture just gives us so much insight to the events that, that both preceded this and came afterwards. Notice in verse number 34 of Matthew 14, and I'm almost done. The Bible says, And when they were gone over, they came into the land of Gennesaret. And when the men of that place had knowledge of him, they sent out into all the, that country round about and brought unto him all that were diseased and besought him that they might only touch the hem of his garment. Now, where do you suppose they got that idea? Well, from the woman who told the world about what Jesus had done. They wanted the same thing. And as many as touched were made perfectly whole. Why did Jesus deal with the woman publicly? Why didn't he just simply allow her to remain anonymous? She kind of crept in, touched the border, got healed, and then went on her life. Well, I think there's many reasons. I want you to see, for one thing, she, uh, the Lord did it for, for her sake. He wanted to be more than something than just her healer. He wanted to be her savior. He wanted to be her friend. He wanted her to look into his face and to feel his warmth and tenderness and hear his loving words of assurance. By the time that he, spent it, he finished speaking to her, she experienced something much more than just being healed of her disease. To be made whole meant much more than just receiving physical healing. You see, that day... She received spiritual healing as well. He dealt with her publicly, not only for her own sake, but I believe for the sake of Jairus. Jairus is trying to get him to come. Remember, heal her 12, his 12-year-old daughter. And so can you imagine that he sees this miraculous power that's available heal the woman that's been sick for 12 years? Can you imagine the comfort? that Jairus felt right there? I mean, it's, it's bad enough if, if it were me, if, if I had Caroline, Caroline's 13, if, if she was at home on the brink of death, I knew time was of the essence, and I'm seeing all these people throng the only person that can heal her, and it's keeping him from coming. Oh, I would be, can you imagine? I have, I have trouble with a person not going in the green light. Can you imagine? I'd be losing my mind. So Jesus can see that Twelve years is nothing for him to heal. Don't worry. I believe he did it for Jairus' sake. That even if people interfered and stopped Jesus' progress, don't worry. The Lord would come and fix it. And I, I believe also she was dealt with publicly so that she could have a testimony and glorify the Lord with what has taken place in her life. I like what Psalm 107 verse 2 says. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. How many of us have done that this week? I like what verse 20 says of Psalm 107. It said, He sent His word and healed them and delivered them from their destructions. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for His goodness and for His wonderful works to the children of men. That's why He dealt with her publicly so that the redeemed can say so and publicly declare the goodness of the Lord, which is what every one of us as a son and daughter of God is called to do. Why does Christ allow his power to be available to us in the first place? The power, you know, the Bible says, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, Romans chapter 1, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. How is that available to you and I? Uh, it says, this, is, this is the reason why. Why is his power available? He loves us. He takes pity 
on his children. Ephesians chapter two and verse number four, it says, but God who is rich in mercy for, he, for his great love wherewith he loved us. He is rich in mercy. Why is he pitiful toward us? Because of his love. His power being available to you and me today is because he loves us, because he cares about us, because he has mercy upon us. I'm thankful today for his power. I'm thankful for his power because it is particular. It is, to, it is the Lord alone that has the power to save. I, I'm thankful for his power today because it is personal. I like that he said, who touched me? That he cared about that woman as an individual. He cares about you and I individually, not just corporately. He sees us, not just our representative, you see. And then he is pitying. He loves us so much. Daughter, go in peace. You are whole of that plague. It's never coming back because he loved her. As the instrument begins to play today, I just want to challenge you today with God's word. Are you thankful for the power that's available to you? Are you grateful today for what God has done? Are you grateful today that he, that he cares about you? And he says, I love Michael, and I love Katie, and I love Laura, and I love Tim, and I love Jennifer, and I love Caleb. I, I don't just love the church. I love Rusty, and I love Loretta, and I love Courtney, and I love Chris. He loves us as individuals. He, he saved us. All the events of our life brought us to a point where we could hear the gospel because he loved you so much that he wanted you to be saved. And I'm thankful today that we can know that he's the only way to heaven. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. His power, His saving power is particular to Jesus Christ. His name that we call upon. His name which is above, above every name. And I'm thankful today that He pities us. I'm thankful today that He sees us in our condition. Our life is like a flower that fades away. Our life is like water spilt on the ground. He knows how fragile and weak we are. So He takes the time to be involved in our life day by day. That He knows our weaknesses. He knows what we need. He knows that we can cast our burden upon the Lord. He's available. And I pray today that you would take advantage of that time that you have with Him. To know that when you call upon His name, He doesn't just say, oh, here's, here's another one of those millions of Christians. No, nope. individually. He's thinking about your life. Aren't you grateful for the story today? Aren't you grateful for the power of God? Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your word. I pray for our church. They would remain strong. Lord, that they would know that you are very much in control of the situation, that you care about what they're going through. And that you're going to meet our needs according to his riches and glory. Thank you, Lord, for this great example of this anonymous woman that wasn't anonymous with you. We're grateful today. One day we'll see her in glory. 